Hello and welcome to Surgery Secrets, where we go behind the scenes to uncover secrets about surgery you won't hear in the classroom. My name is Isabel, and today we are sitting down with Dr. Marcia. Let's get started. So first we'll start with some quick fire questions. So can you tell us your name? Marcia Clark. And what is your occupation? I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And where do you work? I work in Calgary, Alberta at Self Health Campus. And what does your job entail? Uh, this is supposed to be rapid fire, right? And you can go on a little yeah. bit. <clears throat> okay, so clinically, I am an um, adult orthopedic surgeon doing trauma care, uh, hip and knee reconstruction and sport medicine. I have a leadership job where I'm the chief of surgery at the hospital that I work at and help guide um, policies and um, other surgical things throughout our zone in Calgary. And uh, I do medical education research, a lot of medical education teaching and policy uh, um, development and standards and accreditation through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. So I wear many hats. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite color? Purple. Your favorite food? Bacon and maple syrup. Mm, that sounds good. <laughs> um, your favorite superhero? I had to think about this one because I'm currently going through the Marvel um, Cinematic Universe, mm -hmm. but I actually think Wonder Woman right now. She's not a Marvel character, I know, but... <laughs> it's okay, we'll let it pass. <laughs> um, your favorite musical artist? Radiohead. Um, your favorite organ of the body? So it's either the heart or the liver. One, the liver regenerates um, the heart itself. When we talk about a broken heart, there's really, um, as a muscle, it's, well, this is supposed to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting. We talk about a broken heart, but really it's a muscle. And if you ever try and stitch together a broken heart, it just pulls, pulls through. So I find the heart very interesting, mm -hmm. metaphorically and, and in um, literally. Uh -huh. What is the last book you read? So uh, fiction, it was The Midlight Library by Matt Haig. Haig? Yeah, Haig, H-I-A-G. And nonfiction, it was Mike Carney's book on values. And can you recommend me a TV show? Yeah, currently I'm into Ted Lasso. So oh. I really like Ted Lasso. Yeah, yes, he's I optimistic, he's kind. Um, he sees the whole person, but he also has foibles or um, you know, his own stuff going on. Yeah, I heard that's a really good one. Mm -hmm. So you passed the quick fire round. So we'll move on to our nitty gritty questions. So can you tell me who your biggest influence is? So um, when I reflect on that question, um, it's this sort of ebbs and flows and it sort of depends where I am professionally or non-professionally. I've had several influences or influencers. Um, currently, um, my biggest influencer is Alice Reimer, who's a tech entrepreneur and a friend, but she has certainly influenced me in opening up my way of thinking about um, med tech and health tech commercialization and scalability. That's led me down to a, a very interesting road in advising health te technology companies and uh, venture capital funds. So Alice currently is an influencer non-clinically. Um, and then clinically, uh, thinking back on people who trained me, um, John McIver for his kindness, he was our, my program director. Um, David Otto for his hands and how he um, was so smooth in, in, in the way his, he worked. Um, and then uh, Susan Breen, who's a neurosurgeon, at the, um, used to be at the Royal College, is now in New Brunswick, and her big picture thinking around policy and change. So several people kind of depends where I am in my life. Um, in terms of um, reverse influencer, um, I remember going to the Canadian Forces in um, Ottawa to inquire about um, joining the forces and saying I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. This is when I was a medical student. And that person <clears throat> laughed at me, said, do you know how hard that is? And um, that spurred me on even more. So, yeah. So I don't know if that's a 
uh, that's an influencer, but in a reverse way, that was unattended probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they lift the fire underneath you to keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you spoke a little bit about your training and, and that must be a memorable moment for you. Do you have another like most memorable moment from your training? I think when I group many of them together, it's in what's called, what I'm going to call myth busting. So it was in um, the way, and, and, you know, in training, you're in a growth mindset too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as a uh, young female orthopedic trainee who happened to be pregnant in residency, you know, myth, myth busting, many of those things that people sort of had mental models about what you should or shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, reducing a hip uh, um, in the emergency room with my big pregnant belly, right? Things like that. Um, so it was, it was really people just saying, wow, I didn't know you could do that or, you, or, or changing their understanding of what orthopedic surgery is and the people who are in orthopedic surgery. So. Oh, that's so cool. I'm so happy you, you talked about that because, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's so great. I just yeah. heard, like all the... Female yeah. Well, I mean, that was in uh, early 2000s that I was yeah. pregnant um, with my first child. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, you just you, you yeah. made it work. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, so I'm, you, like you said, there's tons of, of memorable moments in your training. Do you have a recent memorable moment? Yeah. Um, so... I um, rem took care of this woman from a Mennonite community and her husband always accompanied her and he was quite a gregarious gentleman. So he, he really um, myth busted for me interacting with people from the Mennonite community and how open they were, <clears throat> number one. But number two, this woman had been told all along that she was too large to have surgery and she had clear debilitating arthritis mm -hmm. a very complex need to take care of <clears throat> they 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 were engaged in their healing process and and what it took to get them through su surgery successfully and uh you know many of the memorable moments are from patients really and how thankful and grateful you are and so this um woman was so grateful that one her leg was so straight mm -hmm. and stable and under her um, too, her, her husband was so grateful because he could see this change in his wife. And he hugged me. <laughs> like, it's just so yeah. different for, um, you know, um, for people to hug you, first of all, but mm -hmm. and to be so grateful. And then later in clinic, when they came for a follow up, they walked down the hall with this wheelchair and it was full of potatoes, and baked bread. <laughs> So it was pretty fun. That was, that's a memorable moment recently, but there's many, many, many from, from patients mm -hmm. um, uh, in the type of care that I do with the arthritis care. They're, they're so grateful not to be in pain. Mm -hmm. You see 10 years come off their face yeah. when they don't have pain. Their, their, their family members thank you gratefully because they have their partner back or their mom back or their mm -hmm. spouse back. So, yeah. 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 My, my grandma had two knee replacements because of arthritis and, and it's, it must be cool for you as a surgeon to see kind of like the instant, um, I guess not healing, but you can see the improvement right away. Yeah. So you see your, the impact of your surgery in a very quick way. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, I'm just very small part of the process. Mm -hmm. It is a process and a patient and their family really need to engage in that process to get the best outcome. Mm -hmm. So I guess we kind of talked about what people love about you as a surgeon and, and how you can help people. Is there anything people in your life don't understand about your job? Well, I think they have a mental model that it's all physical mm -hmm. um, and you have to be a very large, tall person to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I think they underestimate how you use your equipment and your team around you mm -hmm. to do the surgeries. And it's really learning those skills. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there it is very physical and dynamic surgery, um, which allows me to train for surgery. Like I feel like I'm an athlete, mm -hmm. um, still continuously training and such. 
so I can be at my best to do the surgery itself. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about the surgery, it's about the whole conversation with um, the patients, about expectations, about outcomes, about their input, about my input, what I'll do for you, mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things. So, yeah, but can't do it without the team. No. You need the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So what would you say is the absolute best part about your job? Uh, how I impact people in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, what keeps, fills my cup. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess on the other side of that, what's the yeah. uh, worst part of your job? Uh, I think if it's anything in medicine, um, you're not exposed to the amount of paperwork. Mm. A single patient interaction leads to at least five different pieces of paperwork that I would have to do or computer work, um, the dictations, um, the clearing of transcriptions, the orders, all the, I mean, there's so much paperwork. And if you don't stay on top of it and are diligent about it, it can really um, um, lead to some problems. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, you know, especially in trauma care, when you're, you want to be contemporaneous with your dictations and your paperwork stating the risks and complications, what you talk to with the patient, the family. My, uh, I've had instances where I've gone reflected back on my dictations from five years prior when I met this patient for a trauma and the clarity in my notes really helped me um, when the lawyer letters came or mm -hmm. the patients came back with other subsequent downstream problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so that contemporaneous, meaning do your documentation right away, timestamp it, um, review it and be as detailed as possible. But, um, so that's one, one thing that I just don't like, but it <laughs> saved my butt many yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's, I guess, kind of going more to fun storytelling time, if you have any, what's kind of the weirdest or grossest thing that's ever happened to you at work? Yeah, I was reflecting on this. There's, there's like, there's a residency story and then there's a staff person story. So the sure. residency story, um, so the residency story uh, was when I was a resident in intensive care and a patient came in with a COPD exacerbation, had to be intubated and needed lines. And, uh, and he had a Foley catheter in, but he had this um, erection mm -hmm. and um, it ended up, he had a penile implant and I didn't understand it. He was an older person. It was an older implant. I didn't understand how it operated or anything like that. And, and, you know, you're having to put these lines in and it keeps kind of falling into the field, oh, <laughs> so no. to speak. So you have to tape the Foley catheter over and and it's in, yeah anyway so you know i then had to call my urology colleagues to find out how i managed this penile implant and um, um and it's just a bulb in the scrotum that you have to press to deflate it yeah so that was embarrassing and then i didn't live it down in my icu rotation um on my last day they put a rectal uh, what was it um um, they put this big rectal tube thing in my coat pockets and stuff like that. Like they were really silly. Yeah. So, you know, in this day and age, that would be totally inappropriate behavior, but you know, back then <laughs> it was kind of funny. So that's, that was one. Oh my the God. one that was, um, you know, weirdest messages, et cetera, are infections, especially like gangrene mm -hmm. and dealing with gangrene. And especially when it's life threatening um, and in weird muscle planes um so so dealing with gangrene um, that's rapidly progressive of the legs and just even to prep the legs you have to elevate the legs to put tourniquets on or not and all of the the toxins from the gangrene are load the heart and the anesthesia is freaking out and you're just having to do this rapid amputation like it can be really awful and um, you're just trying to save someone's life right yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> the situations you get put into when you're a healthcare professional are just. Yeah, you see, you see the dirty underbelly of humanity. You see, um, you know, retrospectively decision making that maybe wasn't the best mm -hmm. uh, on the patient's end. And you see, you see things that happen to people 
that are really unfortunate. So when those kind of unfortunate cases come in, um, do you lean on your support system? Of course. Yeah. 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 Can you tell us about, about your support system? So I think there's an informal and a formal support system. The formal support system certainly is with our Alberta, like our um, physician groups with, uh, within Alberta, uh, physician support system that you can call and connect with, <clears throat> with help right away. Um, so that's um, always knowing that resource is super important, especially in the COVID era. <laughs> Um, for us. Informally, it's your friends and your family. And how do you keep those relationships cultivated and healthy and still take care of yourself um, and then, you know, rely on them and ask for help. Right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, friends and family. Mm -hmm. So Definitely. and exercise. Yeah. <laughs> and good sleep. <laughs> good sleep. <laughs> sleep hygiene, super important. I think more people need to hear that. Just anyone in school. Well, the evidence is coming out, right? If you look at sleep studies and sleep hygiene, um, there's podcasts about it. I mean, really important mm -hmm. for your, your brain, mm -hmm. not only physically, but for your brain. Yeah. yeah. So when you were in school, did you ever imagine yourself living your current life? No, I never thought I'd be a physician. I never thought I'd be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, kind of life puts things in front of you that, that lead you down certain ways. So no, I never thought, and I never, um, I never thought I'd be an orthopedic surgeon, but once I made the decision, mostly because people told me I couldn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and and you can craft it, right? Mm -hmm. You can craft. Um, the, there's many things you can craft and feel have autonomy over. So, so if you weren't doing your current career, what career do you think you'd most like to do? So in medicine, I think I'd like to be an anesthetist, mm -hmm. or um, you know, with with uh, with all this exposure and COVID around the lab and patho lab lab medicine. Um, I've got to know some lab medicine specialists and the science behind that and um, super interesting. So um, maybe that if um, so non-medical, I'd probably be in sports science in some capacity. Cool. So I guess we're on to our last question here. Um, if you could go back, what advice would you give yourself or someone considering your career? Um, so so advice as to be in medicine or as a surgeon. So specifically with surgery, surgery is about thinking and doing. It's the same with anesthesia, but it is a um, procedurally based, but also thinking based. And so you have to hone both of those abilities and skills. Um, the um, So your life in surgery or my week in surgery, only two days a week are surgery and the rest is everything else. And so, um, really being open, being curious, being patient with yourself, being patient with processes, recognizing that things change and adapt all the time. You can't have control over everything. Being very, learning to be flexible, nimble, and um, uh, dynamic. Um, that's, I would t definitely tell myself that. You know, you have this idea about, um, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to be happy here then and I'll be complete here then and then I'll go to live in this place all you can have you can have a great map as long as you have a really good compass you'll get to where you need to go um, so but be open curious and flexible and that and that really starts with no knowing yourself right um, and knowing and loving yourself and being compassionate and kind to yourself first and then going forward. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Marcia Clark, for joining us today on Surgery 101. Yeah. Uh, on Surgery Secrets. Yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you join our series. Yeah, good luck to everyone out there and you'll find a career and a path. It'll unfold for you. Don't fight it. <laughs> And there you have it. Join us next time for another exclusive look into surgery today. Follow us on LinkedIn for new surgery secrets episodes and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more information on Surgery 101, head to our website, surgery101.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.